In December of 1996, the 32-64-bit console war was well underway. Sega's Saturn console had stumbled out of the gate and had fallen well behind. Sony's freshman PlayStation console had taken the video game world by storm, was selling very well, and was earning fans around the world. And Nintendo's Nintendo 64 console, originally codenamed the Ultra 64, had jumped out of the gate here in the U.S. in September of 1996 and was beginning to gain speed. As we looked forward to 1997, in December of 1996, we were getting our first look at magazines for 1997, including the 100th anniversary issue of GamePro Magazine, which is the game magazine we'll be opening in this episode of Print from the Past. As you see here, Reloaded is the main game that is shown on the front, as you also see the birthday cake. But we have lots of other games to talk about here. Castlevania X, Tomb Raider, Destruction Derby 2. We have Donkey Kong Country 3, Crusader No Remorse. We have a several different games actually to look at. An ad for GamePro TV. And yes, we do see down here in the lower right-hand corner ads for GamePro.com as we were starting to really get on the internet more and more often. Let's go ahead and open this up and read through this magazine together, shall we? This is still in the plastic. We also do have an envelope for a renewal that we'll take out, but you can see that all that stuff is in here. So let's go ahead and just open this up. I've been sitting on this for about a year, so I'm excited to finally get it open, and there it is and take a look and see what's on the inside. I have talked in the past about the fact that I love 1997 as a video game year for video game consoles. Uh, although a lot of the games that I was more interested in came out in the second half of the year, uh, overall I look at the year as my favorite ever. We look on the back here, just to show you really quick, we have an ad for WWF In Your House from Acclaim. And when we open up the magazine. The first thing that we see is an ad for Shadows of the Empire for the N64. And here is the ad for it with the really cool looking N64 controller in outer space there. I got that game pretty close to its launch period and I loved it at first. Uh, as a lot of people talk about, the, uh, the first level on Hoth when you're in the snow speeder was remarkable, something that we had never really seen before and blew us away. And it was all the same for me too. But when we got to the on foot stages, when it, whether it was either first person or third person, eh, it was iffy. Uh, some of the, uh, the shooting was suspect. Some of the boss battles seemed a little bit unfair. And the other vehicle battles or vehicle stages you would see in the game just didn't match up to really the climax of the game, which was right out of the gate. It was really difficult to keep that level of pace going. Of course, that Hoth level of Shadows of the Empire would make its way or lead to the development of Rogue Squadron for the N64, which would come out about two and a half years later, or a year and a half later. The next page, we see an ad here for NFL Game Day 97. I believe that's Junior Seau on the front there, you and what army. This, of course, the follow-up to NFL Game Day, uh, which had stormed out of the gate and had taken EA completely by surprise, whereas Madden 96 had been canceled for the PlayStation, NFL Game Day was basically running unopposed, and while NFL Game Day would have its first matchup with Madden in the 1997 sports year, NFL Game Day was comfortably in the lead as it had established a strong following on a console that had taken a lot of people by storm early on. Next up, we see an ad here for Blood Omen, The Legacy of Cain, a, an action RPG that a lot of people are fans of in this series. I'm not sure whether it really got back to that original kind of format. Uh, for me, it wasn't really a game for me. Uh, I do I do own it. I do like the setting, and I like the voice acting in the game, but I, just, I, I couldn't get into it like others did, unfortunately. Next up, we have an ad that I am excited to show because, well, you'll see. This is an ad for Samsung's GX TV, and yes, I still have my GX TV. I have shown you videos of it on the YouTube channel. Uh, I have it in the background for my teaching job so that students can see it. 
It is a small package that packs a punch still. And I got this TV in 97. So it's been, let's see, three, so 23 years my TV has been running. Uh, somehow uh, the tube is tired, but the sound is still awesome. And I'm still running all of my retro game consoles on there. Everything that's not HD is running on that CRT. I'll be very sad when the tube does go. And I know that that day is probably coming sooner rather than later. But the sound that this TV creates because of its subwoofer on the back that you can see kind of in the corner up there uh, is just absolutely remarkable uh, and still sounds great. Now that I'm living in an apartment building instead of my own place uh, where I have to kind of be mindful of my sound, I have to keep the volume down, unfortunately. And it actually does say uh, that aimed right at your eardrums, the sound is aimed right at your eardrums, it's meant to be played loud. Also have an ad here or a pair of ads for virtual cop and virtual on for the Saturn. So while the Saturn had stumbled out of the gate, it was not completely, oops, sorry about that. It was not completely dead at that point. Uh, people were still buying the Saturn and buying the games. It just wasn't really competing with the PlayStation and the N64 at that time. More ads here. We have ads for NBA hang time and then opposite, we have one for NBA Jam Extreme. I don't know how this worked or why this worked this way, uh, but those are two competing games. Uh, NBA Jam Extreme, of course, Acclaim had the NBA Jam license at that point, decided to take NBA Jam into the world of polygons and 3D visuals, whereas NBA Hangtime was staying very true to the 2D view uh, with some additions like double dunks and alley-oops. Uh, I love NBA Hangtime, especially for the N64. Uh, the N64 version is by far the best ver home version of the game available, whereas NBA Jam Extreme on pretty much every console was just terrible, which is too bad. <clears throat> More basketball. We have an ad here for NBA Live 97. NBA Live, unlike Madden and unlike NHL, had gotten its start with NBA Live 96, or pretty much right out of the gate for the PlayStation. So Sony was not able to stay with NBA Live. Uh, and by the time 97, especially 98 came out, it was just a lead that NBA Shootout could not surpass. Uh, NBA Live games during the PlayStation, especially the PS2 era, very, very good. We finally have our first look at some contents here, including a look at Reloaded, Silverload for PlayStation to give you some strategy for, as well as Star Gladiator, and for Mortal Kombat Trilogy. We also have an ad for Street Racer, as well. Um, if we're talking about GamePro really quickly, <clears throat> I love GamePro Magazine. I bought it religiously when it hit newsstands. I've talked about this on other episodes of print from the past. There are several magazines that I have bought pretty much from the jump. Electronic Gaming Monthly is one. GamePro is another. And... Uh, Video Games and Computer Entertainment was another. Uh, game Players was another. I spent, I, I don't even want to admit how much money on video game magazines every month, but this is one, no matter who it appealed to or didn't appeal to, I thought that this had a wide appeal both for kids and adults, and I thought that this magazine was really cool. All right, moving on here. We have a list of different games as well as an ad for Area 51. So one thing that GamePro does is it lists all of the games that it covers, which you can see over here on this side. Uh, so if you're looking for information about a specific game, you could just skip right to that page rather than leaving through. I never did that. I read this from stem to stern, much like we're going to do in this episode. And of course, the Area 51 ad right over here, that's a light gun game from the arcade that was ported to the Saturn and the PlayStation. Really cool looking ad for Tekken 2. Namco and PlayStation were a marriage made in heaven from Ridge Racer to Ace Combat to Tekken to the Namco Museum series to lesser games like Cyber Sled and uh, Dragon Valor. Uh, 
Pac-Man World, uh, Miss Pac-Man Maze Madness. I mean, it, it really was a, an embarrassment of riches for the PlayStation from Namco, and such a great matchup. Tekken 2 was such a big step forward from the original Tekken in terms of content, in terms of fighters, uh, in terms of graphics. It was really phenomenal. Uh, I wasn't going to buy it originally because I'm more of a Street Fighter guy than a Tekken guy, but uh, glowing right up of Tekken 2 in Game Fan Magazine changed my mind, and if I'm being honest, I'm glad it did. Uh, I stink at Tekken. I am not very good at it, but I still play Tekken 2 every now and again, and I really do enjoy myself. An ad here for NHL Power Play 96 with the Colorado Avalanche being shown with the Stanley Cup there. I have not played much of the NHL Power Play series. I really should get to that. I think I have 96, but not 98. Um, so maybe the retro referee can take a look at that in a future episode. I need to make some time to play that, maybe over my uh, school break over the next week or so. An ad for Tecmo's Deception as well as a reservation form for you to reserve the game or pre-order the game at retailers. Deception, of course, is this very interesting strategy-type puzzle game where you have to set traps to kill enemies. Uh, I didn't like the first Deception, if I'm being honest, but Deception 2, uh, which is Kagero, and Deception 3, which is Dark Delusion, also trapped for the PlayStation 2. Excellent games, uh, and they're not even really... Uh, guilty pleasures. They're just a lot of fun to play. Uh, they make you think. I love the trap combos where you can hold someone a bear trap, then shoot an arrow out of a slit in the wall, and then finish them off with a rolling rock down a staircase. Uh, a lot of fun for those games to be played. Again, you're going to hear my heater running in the background. That is what winter in New England will do. As of this recording, it is the first day of winter here in New England, uh, and it is very, very cold. Uh, as a matter of fact, for Christmas, we're expecting some like 60 or 70 mile an hour winds, which I'm not looking forward to. We have a nice letter from the Game Pros talking about the Game Pros 100th issue. Everyone warmed up? Okay, let's hear it loud and proud. Game Pro, Game Pro, Game Pro. We're entitled to a little celebrating. You're now reading the 100th issue of Game Pro, a pretty special accomplishment considering no other video game magazine has hit 100. Our 100 equals seven and a half years of regular magazines and special editions, all adding up to over 20,000 pages worth of the latest and greatest video game information. 20,000 pages, that's a lot of game tips. And there's more here from the game pros. Um, I actually did have this magazine when it was new. It's really cool to open it up new again. We also have some ads here, or not some ads, but some letters to the editor, uh, talking about controller controversy. Uh, oh, this is good because we're talking about the uh, the N64 controller. I'm writing to contest your editors who have been praising the new controller for the Nintendo 64. I think it's too small and is uncomfortable to use. In Super Mario 64, I thought Mario was hard to control. The joystick is a, the worst thing about the system. The N64 is not what I expected it to be, mostly because of the controller. Its third leg and thumbstick just get in the way. The traditional D-pad would have been much better. I hate to say this, but I agree. Uh, the Nintendo 64 controller, especially the really brittle analog stick, while the analog stick was a step forward for controller design, the stick is just too loose. Uh, it it get, becomes loose after very short amounts of play. Uh, and I really don't like the controller button setup where you have the two big face buttons and then the four smaller C buttons. Uh, to me, that just doesn't work well. However, I will give the Nintendo 64 controller props for its awesome D-pad. Uh, it is a lot of fun to play like Tony Hawk with, for example. Oh, this is good. What was the first game, game Pro ever reviewed? Who was the reviewer? And what was the first game to get a perfect score? Our first Pro View uh, ran 99 issues ago in issue number one, April, May of 1989. That game was Operation Wolf for the NES, reviewed by The Eliminator. Actual ratings faces didn't debut until October 1990. The first game to barely miss all perfect ratings was Mega Man 3 for the NES, which missed in one category, which was challenged back in November 1990. The first game to get all perfect scores was Gyaris for the Genesis in our 1991 March issue. That's kind of a cool piece of history right there. Then, of course, there was this watchdog section where you got to write, uh, or, or buyer beware, where you got to write consumer-related letters to the uh, 
to Game Pro and they were trying to look up and see what was going on, whether you were getting taken or not. Uh, I always loved this. Uh, it was a really neat way for the magazine to be pro-consumer. I thought that was really cool. Uh, let's see if there's anything interesting here. Oh! Question, I feel I've been ripped off. I bought the September issue of Game Pro because of the Twisted Metal 2 screenshot you had on the front cover, but inside the issue there's no review, no article, no nothing. What gives? Answer, we blew it and were canine enough to admit it. Originally, we had a preview of Twisted Metal 2 scheduled to run in the September issue, which is why we put out the screenshot on the cover. At the last second, we decided to make an editorial change, but missed the cover screenshot. We had no intention of deceiving anyone. So yeah, it does happen. When you're sending something to print, once it goes to print and it's already out there, you can't change it. Unlike online these days, where if you make a mistake, you can just go and actively edit it. Uh, so that made things a bit more complicated. An ad here for Jet Moto for the PlayStation, another game from the talented minds at Single Track Studios who gave us Twisted Metal and Warhawk. I wish I was better at Jet Moto. I really do. I love the premise of the game. I think it's a really cool racing game, but again, as I tend to say about a lot of games, and it's kind of embarrassing, I'm not very good at this. An ad for Knights from the PlayStation, a game that I hear so much about. A lot of people love this game. I played the HD version of it for the Xbox 360, and I, I'm sorry, I, I don't get it. Uh, I guess I see some of the similarities to Sonic, maybe, sort of, kind of, and I like the setting. I think the setting is, is unique, um, but for me, I just never understood the big deal. I, I, sorry, I just didn't. <laughs> big game... Big name games slowed by delays. This is the cover story of Pro News. I should get like the little news sound effect there. Uh, let's see what games were delayed. To the consternation of eager gamers, several high profile games expected in stores before Christmas were delayed until early 97. The N64 suffered the biggest blow and tore out the Dinosaur Hunter from acclaim, missed a big holiday shopping season and is tentatively scheduled as an early 97 release. In addition to Turok, two otherly eagerly awaited games had their brakes applied just before Christmas. Duke Nukem 3D for the PlayStation won't be out until September of 1997, a delay of almost a year from the original launch target. And Independence Day for the PlayStation and Saturn um, would not come out until January or February. Mega Man 8 for the PlayStation and Marvel Super Heroes for the PlayStation all slipped a couple of months to February 97, as did Data East's MVP College Football, which no one's really missing. IDOS Interactive canceled the Dream Team basketball game for the PlayStation and Saturn, and Final Fantasy VII for the PlayStation was pushed from uh, early December to January, February, or beyond. Of course, it came out in September of 97 here in the U.S. New controversy over video game violence over a game called Schoolyard Slaughter. I don't really remember hearing much about that, but okay. Let's see here. Not much else going on there. Online Gaming 101, a primer on how to use four online gaming services. So remember, we're now from late 96 to early 97. More people are getting computers in their homes and getting online was starting to become more of a trend. So with this Game Pro with NetPro, which is their section about online gaming, uh, Game Pro gives us some pointers as to how to get online using Let's see, what are they using? Dwango, M Player, the Total Entertainment Network, and Engage. Man, I remember 10. I remember the Total Entertainment Network. If I'm being honest, I never really played any online games. Shame on me. The equipment you need to play online games you need a 486 PC, Windows 95, 8 megabytes of RAM. Remember what was it? 8 megabytes of RAM? 16 megabytes is recommended. 8 megabytes, now it's like 8 gig. <laughs> Goes to show you how much things have changed. A CD-ROM drive, a 14.4 baud modem, 28.8 is recommended back when we were doing just dial-up. A web browser such as Internet Explorer or Netscape Navigator, F in the chat for Netscape. And joystick, 16-bit sound card for Windows 95 speakers and microphone. Those were the days, let me tell you. We have an ad here for two-on-two -two open ice challenge. Oops, and we lost a little... Uh, subscription card. Open Ice Challenge, I've talked about this before. 
uh, an awesome game from Midway that really got overshadowed by NBA Jam, but is a fun way to play hockey. Um, and it's also available for the PlayStation and for PC. I strongly recommend checking it out. 100 issues and over 200 writers. And we have the Game Pro timeline down at the bottom here, which is very cool. I'm not going to read all this stuff, but Game Pro already at this point in '97 has had a very long lifespan with a uh, with a cavalcade of different writers, uh, and it's very cool for Game Pro to salute all of those people and its own timeline. Uh, to make it seven and a half years or even longer, as Game Pro did, is certainly notable. They also go through each year and they note the different writers from each year and some of the other uh, main events. 1991, it talks about Game uh, Game Pro TV way, uh, with J.D. Roth hosting. Uh, what's one of my guilty pleasures? Uh, I didn't get to watch it much when it was on TV, but thanks to YouTube, it's been saved, and I've been able to watch a couple of episodes, and I really appreciate those. There's an ad here for Rebel Assault 2. Now, I am going to go to bat for this game. I really enjoy playing Rebel Assault 2, even though it's basically the same thing every time. Uh, it really built on the original Rebel Assault, the fact that they had different actors, uh, but using the same John Williams soundtrack and just a more seamless uh, interaction with FMV, I thought was really, really strong. Um, I know people tend to pick on FMV games or full motion video games, but those are some of my favorite kinds of games to play. So I really do enjoy this game quite a bit. And I did open a brand new copy of it on Unsealed a couple of years ago. Handhelds for the holidays. We've got some reviews for Donkey Kong Land 2, Diddy's Conquest for the Game Boy, getting a perfect 5.0. X-Men Mojo World for the Game Gear, getting a 4. Tetris Attack for the Game Boy, getting a 4. FIFA 97 getting a 4 for the Game Boy. Bugs Bunny and Double Trouble for the Game Gear getting a 3. Pinocchio getting a 3 for the Game Boy. Madden 97 for the big Game Boy getting a 3. And Street Racer for the Game Boy getting a 3, among others. These capsulated reviews are just fun to read really quick just to see what they thought of these particular games. And of course, handhelds in 97, uh, we were still pretty much working with the Game Boy and the Game Gear. Uh, we were about a year away from the Game Boy Color. We have our first look at Castlevania X Moonlight Nocturne, and we know what that wound up turning into. That would wind up becoming Castlevania Symphony of the Night, one of, if not the best, Castlevania games of all time. That game for me, between Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Super Castlevania 4, are like neck and neck for my favorite of all time. Uh, and it changes. Sometimes I go with Super Castlevania 4, sometimes I go with Symphony of the Night. It is just that close. Uh, those two games pretty much 1 and 1A one for me, with Castlevania Bloodlines just slightly lagging behind. What else do we have here? We have an ad that I'm trying to get past. We have some sneak previews for Cruisin' USA and Crusader No Remorse. I have talked about Cruisin' USA in the past. Um, it is one of my favorite N64 games. Uh, is it perfect? No. Is it a great game? Not necessarily, but it is a very fun arcade racing game to play, and I love the different stops through the country. And I think it runs well on the N64, if I'm being honest. Uh, it is an enjoyable game. I like Cruising World just a bit better, uh, but the Cruising games, I have a very soft spot for those in my own memory. Other previews include Spider for the PlayStation, Mech Warrior 2 for the PlayStation, and Saturn. Pitfall 3D for the uh, PlayStation, and also Tunnel B1 for the PlayStation. Uh, you can take a look at some of these screenshots here. Spider for the PlayStation is a pretty interesting game, and it's a game that I've been meaning to get around to playing. I do own it, um, and it's I, I've heard good things about it, and the very brief amount of time that I've spent with it has been pretty, fairly positive, I should say. Say that three times fast. More previews here for Broken Helix for the PlayStation, Amok for the Saturn, Wild Nines for the PlayStation, and Apocalypse for the PlayStation. Apocalypse looking a lot different in these screenshots than it did at the very end. I think you're looking down there. Uh, I think that's the game with Bruce Willis as a star, if I remember right. Yeah, interesting. 
Uh, Activision also has something in the works for you shooter fans out there. It's a 3D run-and-gun game called Apocalypse, featuring some cool rendered characters and a variety of perspectives. The camera is in constant motion from over the shoulder to a side view to an overhead angle as you roll, strafe, crouch, and jump through the bizarre levels. There are several modes of play, including a driving level. Apocalypse look like, looks like a promising prospect, a creepy Resident Evil clone with a flair for firepower. Resident Evil is in a run and gun. What, whatever. Whatever. More previews here. Scorcher for the Saturn. Starwinder for the PlayStation. Daredevil Derby for the PlayStation. Mega Man 8 for the PlayStation. Dr. Waiwi. Samurai Showdown 3 for the PlayStation. Um... Swiv for the PlayStation. I think that might be SW4, but I don't know what that is. XS for the PlayStation, Sonic 3D Blast for the Saturn, uh, among others. So there you go. There is your look at the screens. Mega Man 8, of course, probably being the star of those screenshots. Um, yeah. Disruptor from Universal Interactive Studios. And oh, by the way, Insomniac Entertainment. Yes. The Spyro the Dragon folks, the Ratchet and Clank people, before those games, Disruptor with some pretty neat full motion video and an interesting game to play if you have it for the original PlayStation. Got to turn this this way so you can take a look at Mech Warrior 2. So we are right smack in the middle of the magazine now. Play Dirty with Three Dirty Dwarves. Okay. <laughs> PC Game Pro taking a look at Toonstruck, ZPC, and Screamer 2, among other things. Uh, Trapped in Toonland getting uh, four and a half, four and a half. So graphics four and a half, sound four and a half, control five, and a fun factor of four. You can see some of the other reviews on the page as well. And that brings us to Game Pro's review types. Where not only do they give you numbers, but they give you faces to kind of give you the idea. Really love the explodingly happy face for 5.0. Uh, the thumbs up for 4.5. And, and the pretty happy 4.0 guy. Sonic 3D Blast for the Saturn. With the very cool looking Sonic close-up. For those of you that want to see Sonic's eye. There you go. <laughs> The PC is an arcade machine, and here we're talking about the National Amusement Network Incorporator, NANI, and Microsoft have teamed up to create a national network system that will link PC-based arcade systems for multiplayer gaming via what else? The internet. So there is a look at that. I don't remember that personally, but again, keep in mind, I was never a PC guy, so I'm not really familiar with how all that works. Hmm, let's see what else we got here. We have an ad for NHL Faceoff 97, which is the follow-up to NHL Faceoff, which, again, ran unopposed like NFL Game Day did. Uh, this game is okay. Uh, it feels very similar to the first game. Uh, however, EA was knocking on the door with NHL 97, and once we got to NHL 98, the race was over. Uh, as much as Sony tried to keep up with its NHL face-off series, uh, EA's NHL games simply dominated during that time. So here's the cover feature of Reloaded, which got a 4.5 for control, a 4.0 for fun factor, a 4.0 for graphics, and a 4.5 for sound. This, of course, the sequel to Loaded, which I believe came out in 95 for the PlayStation, if I remember right. It could have been early 96. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I believe that Reloaded and Loaded are kind of like a Smash TV sort of uh, top-down shooter uh, that works kind of the same way, except with twin sticks. I think you're using the, the face buttons for shooting, but I could be mistaken. It has been a long time since I played an ad here for Destruction Derby 2 for the PlayStation. Again, developed by Reflections and published by Psygnosis. Uh, this game has a underrated rock soundtrack, which I really like. And the other thing about this game that's cool is there are certain jumps in the game that can make your car do all kinds of crazy flips. 
Um, some of the races in the game seem a little unfair, uh, but I do recommend taking a look at this. I believe I did open this up for Unsealed a couple of years ago as well. Uh, fun game. A review here for WWF In Your House, which gets three and a halfs across the board. Uh, three and a half for graphics. Their wrestlers look lifelike, but they're too small. Moreover, their moves left the detail and impact of Power Move Pro Wrestling. Getting smacked down by Power Move Pro Wrestling. That's got to hurt. Fun factor, three and a half. WWF fanatics who don't mind strikingly short matches should step into this ring. Everyone else would be better off renting before buying. 3.5 sound. Mr. Perfect and Vince McMahon provide color commentary that's funny at times, but far too repetitive in control. Three and a half. Moves are easy to perform, but there is little skill involved in winning matches beyond rapidly pounding the punch and kick buttons. Uh, I prefer WWF WrestleMania, the arcade game myself. Uh, I know that this is basically an offshoot of that. Uh, but I think the game's probably where GamePro is saying, like slightly above average. Reviews here for Mortal Kombat Trilogy, as well as an ad here for video game trade-ins at Toys R Us. Mortal Kombat Trilogy, of course, getting all three Mortal Kombat games under one or in one package with a bunch of all the players. Four and a half, four and a half, four and a half, three point oh. Fun factor, four and a half for MK fans. This is the game to get. It's all the MK you could ever want and more. Graphics, four and a half. The game looks almost identical to the arcade game with all the stages and carnage intact. However, some of the fatalities have been altered, like Baraka's Blade Impale, where the victim doesn't squirm. Four and a half for control. While lightning fingers are required to execute the standing button tap combos, the control is very responsive. 3.0 for sound. All the music selections sound like a 45 record played at 33 RPM. However, all the grunts, groans, and other fighting sounds are intact, though the announcer's voice tends to blank out at times. Uh, I've mentioned in the past, while I appreciate Mortal Kombat and I do play Mortal Kombat games, I am not a master. I have always been on the Street Fighter side of the Street Fighter versus Mortal Kombat fence. Uh, but I do own Mortal Kombat Trilogy for the PlayStation and I have played it and it is okay. There are some loading times that make the game also a little bit more annoying. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think the game holds up pretty nicely and certainly looks arcade ready. Power Move Pro Wrestling is also here, getting 4.5, 5.0, 3.5, and 4.5. Control getting a 5.0. Brain Busting Control enables you to easily perform every move imaginable from Scorpion Deathlocks to Root Awakenings. It's very interesting. I think I have this. i got to look and see if I do. Also, there's an ad here for Tokyo Highway Battle, which I have also opened up for Unsealed. Tokyo High Highway Battle has one of the most underrated soundtracks in a video game. It looks like Ridge Racer. But it doesn't sound like it, and it doesn't play like it. There's actually a dedicated drifting button, so you can drift around corners in this game. Destruction Derby 2, getting the review treatment here. 4.5 for graphics, 4.0 for sound and control, and 4.5 for fun factor. There's also an ad here for everyone's favorite game with a cat in a t-shirt. Yes, I am talking about Bubsy 3D. Hightail it into a new dimension. Should have said a Mew dimension. That would have worked out better. And there is the review of Destruction Derby 2 on the side as well. I think you know this, but the development team behind Bubsy 3D went on to develop Siphon Filter. <laughs> so you win some, you lose some. Pandemonium. The first Pandemonium game. Wow, because it is late 96, early 97. 4.5 for graphics, 4.0 for control, 3.0 for sound, 4.0 for fun factor. Pandemonium is a 2.5D platformer. Um, I do like the game. I like it better than its sequel, but I do like the game. Uh, it is a little, maybe, it doesn't hold up well today like it did back when it was released, but I still do revisit it from time to time. Uh, I think graphically it's interesting, and I do like some of the things they do with the 2.5D uh, where... You're kind of running on a 2D plane, and all of a sudden, like, there's set pieces that just look really neat, at least with camera tricks. There's also an ad here for Virtual Fighter 2 for the Genesis. Assault and battery included. Okay. Full page, or full two-page spread for Power Move Pro Wrestling. With Power Move number four, which is the Cranial Crunch. Looks painful. Twisted Metal 2 for the PlayStation. 
one of the more uh, more hyped up sequels for the PlayStation and receiving pretty good scores. A 5.0 for Fun Factor, 4.5, 4.5 I should say, for control and sound and 3.5 for graphics. Twisted Metal 2, I think, really builds on the success of the first game. Uh, I like going back to Twisted Metal 2. I think if I'm ranking them, uh, Twisted Metal Black probably is at the top of the list for the PS2, and then Twisted Metal 2, then 1, and then we can talk about 3 and 4 somewhere in that mix. Is it out here for Robotron X? If you lose, you die. Of course, the 3D take on the popular Robotron 2084 arcade game. Uh, I like that game too, by the way. Uh, I think I like it a little more on the N64 than the PlayStation, but I have both. Soviet Strike for the PlayStation, another game that builds on the Strike series, uh, or, or on a series from a 16-bit console, uh, kind of like Road Rash, except with the Strike games, uh, the gameplay is still difficult, uh, but the full motion video sequences are really, really uh, cool to watch, especially back then. Uh, they look pretty good, and they still hold up today. I wish the game was a little bit easier, because I'd like to see more of the FMV sequences, but nevertheless, I think the game holds up okay. And I believe that it got a 5.0 for sound. It sure did. Also an ad here for GamePro Online. And America Online keyword GamePro. <laughs> Boy, I miss AOL. I've been talking about AOL in some of my classes. Uh, I teach an Internet Basics class, and we've been talking about dial-up and AOL. Um, and I did show an AOL video, uh, but I, I spent a lot of time on AOL in the late 90s. As a matter of fact, I talked to some GamePro editors, uh, not through AOL, but through uh, GamePro's own website in the late 90s as well. Blast Chamber and Contra Legacy of War are reviewed, as well as a look at Tetris Plus. Contra Legacy of War was not good. Blast Chamber was a little more interesting. Contra Legacy of War, when they farmed it out, uh, just no. <laughs> just no. Jet Moto and Epidemic for the PlayStation. Jet Moto not getting very good scores here. 3.0 for sound and graphics, 2 for control, and 2.5 and for fun factor. If you're asking me, and you're probably not, uh, I think you're being a little harsh on the game, but uh, that's just me. An Epidemic for the PlayStation I have not played. Too Extreme for the PlayStation, getting 4.5 for fun factor and control, 4 for graphics, 3.5 for sound. Uh, Too Extreme builds on ESPN Extreme Games minus the ESPN license. Uh, I love that game. Uh, I do play it a couple of times a year. I go back to it when I get some time. Uh, I'm not very good at it now as opposed to when the game had come out. But that whole extreme sports thing really kind of stuck with me even before Street Skater and Tony Hawk had come out. Uh, and I thought that, that game was a lot of fun to play. They also review Bub Bubsy 3D getting three and a half for graphics, sound, and control, and just a three for fun factor. So you can take a look at those reviews and screenshots there for both of those games. And GamePro always would do a reader survey, which you can see on this side here, where you had a chance to win some cool stuff, answer some questions. Of course, that was back when you had to mail stuff in. These days, you could probably just do it online, and it's a lot faster. More reviews for Tobal Number 1, X, uh, Iron Man, Exo Man of War, and The Divide, Enemies Within. There's also a full-page ad for Contra Legacy of War, complete with your 3D glasses. Tobal Number 1, the game I like to say, the free game that came with the paid Final Fantasy VII demo. <laughs> Full, uh, full two-page ad for Mr. Bones here. Don't have any experience with the Saturn, really, so I can't comment on those. Uh, two-page ad for Star Gladiator Episode One: Final Crusade. That's, I believe, a PlayStation game. It's a game I don't own. Uh, maybe I should look into getting it? I don't know. Tomb Raider for the Saturn. So now we're getting into the Saturn section. Uh, we also have an ad for Grid Runner for the Saturn and the PlayStation. Uh, Tomb Raider on the, the uh, Saturn, if you're curious. 4.0 for fun factor and graphics, 3.0 for sound, and 4.5 for control. So you can see the screenshots on the Saturn there, as well as the ad for Grid Runner. Mr. Bones gets a review, as well as Arcadium.com.
Machine Head in Battle Arena Toshinden URA. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Battle Arena Toshinden URA. The Fun Factor gets a sparkling 0 0.5. The very angry, sickened face. It says under Fun Factor, ugly graphics, bland sounds, and dull gameplay. The ingredients of a lousy fighting game. Battle Arena Toshinden URA has all these terrible elements and more. <laughs> you can see the face. Ugh, look at it. Fear it. The face of a 0.5. Also, an ad here for Project Overkill from Konami, by the way, if you're interested. An isometric uh, shooter, third-person shooter. More Saturn reviews for Street Racer, Hyper 3D Pinball, Virtual Casino, and Brain Dead 13, as well as an ad for Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 for the Super Nintendo and Genesis. The ad showing the fetal position up there. And yes, even when we're getting into late 96 and early 97, 16-bit consoles are still a thing. They're not selling gangbusters, but some people are taking their time and transitioning from 16-bit to 32-64-bit, so you're still seeing some tentpole games like your Ultimate Mortal Kombats, like your NBA Hang Times, your College Slams, uh, so that's not surprising. Magic the Gathering Battle Mage getting its two-page spread here. And now we've got some 16-bit survival guide pages as we take a look at Donkey Kong Country 3 and Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, both of these for the Super Nintendo. Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie Kong's Double Trouble getting fives for graphics and control and four and a halfs for sound and fun factor. I just started playing Donkey Kong Country 3 again because it just came out for the Super Nintendo online service uh, for the Switch. Uh, and maybe I've been too harsh on it over the years. I was never really a fan with the third game. I liked the first two better. And if I'm honest, they, in terms of my own priority, uh, I rank them in the same order that they came out. Love Donkey Kong Country. I like Donkey Kong Country 2. And I think that Donkey Kong Country 3 is okay, but maybe I've underestimated it just a little bit. In terms of Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 for the Super Nintendo, we've got a 4.5 for graphics, a 4.0 for sound and control, and a 3.0 for fun factor. And again, you can take a look at the spread here to take a look at some of the screenshots for both. Again, that is, or both of those are the Super Nintendo versions, uh, especially for Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, as Donkey Kong Country 3 was a Super Nintendo exclusive. There's also short reviews here for Pinocchio for the Genesis, SimCity 2000 for the Super Nintendo, and Realm for the Super Nintendo as well. And we have the Sega 900 number for you to call if you get lost or you need advice. Ah, yes. This is the Tobal number one ad. And you can see down at the very bottom, it lists that the Final Fantasy VII demo is included. That's why people bought this game. Anyone else that tells you different is probably fibbing. Just saying. Tecmo Super Bowl. It's unbelievable for the PlayStation. Make no bones about it. This game stunk. In comparison to the 16-bit versions of the game, which were very good, especially on the Super Nintendo side, the PlayStation version just it doesn't feel like a Tecmo Super Bowl game at all. It's choppier, it's clunkier, the play calling is also pretty clunky. Uh, it just took steps in the wrong direction, and that is too bad, because it probably could have been a lot better for 32-bit, uh, but just that did not happen. We're looking at sports pages now, and if you know me, and you know my alter ego, the retro referee, you know we are big into sports here. There is a review of Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey for the Nintendo 64, which gets a 4.0 for graphics, 3.0 for sound and control, a 3.5 for sound and control, and a 4.0 for fun factor. That might be a little harsh. Um, this game is a game that you need to play a little bit to appreciate. Once you get the hang of it and you get used to the controls, it is a lot of fun. Open ice level fun? Maybe not, but I think it's a little bit better than average. NHL 97 for the PlayStation, getting 4.5s for graphics and fun factor and 4.0 for sound and control. 
What stands out to me about NHL 97, aside from the gameplay, which feels a lot like a Genesis game, is all of the full motion video that features John Davidson as a uh, as an announcer. Does a great job with this. We would see John Davidson later in Fox NHL Championship 2000 for the PlayStation. Um, it's not bad, but NHL 98 would destroy this a year later. NBA in the zone two. Some play at a higher level. Uh, this game, I think I've talked about it before. Uh, this might be the best of the in the zone games. Uh, I believe that Michael Jordan is a hidden character in a game. He's not called Jordan, but he has all of Jordan's stats so you can use him. Uh, I do play this from time to time, although I do find myself uh, going back to NBA Live before long. We'll look at MLB Pennant Race for the PlayStation and 3D Baseball for the Saturn. So even in January of 97, we're looking forward to spring training. MLB Pennant Race plays a lot like an arcade baseball game. Uh, the only issue with Pennant Race is that the pacing is just a little too slow to be an arcade game. But other than that, it handles and plays just like it. And I think deserves a second look if you're looking for a PlayStation baseball game that you might have overlooked. In terms of 3D baseball for the Saturn, I don't really have a lot to say on it. But uh, MLB Pennant Race, I do recommend it if you find it for cheap and you like baseball on the PlayStation. FIFA 97 on the PlayStation getting 4.5, 5.0, 4.5, 4 So the only thing getting a 5 is the sound. Um, I'm not the biggest soccer guy, so I don't really have a lot of insight. I would like to learn a little bit more. I do think that FIFA, just like a lot of the other franchises, sports franchises from EA, would really improve for the 98 sports year. 3D Baseball for the uh, PlayStation did not get very good ratings. This outside of the graphics, which got 4.5. The sound and control were a 2.0, and the fun factor is a 2.5. And as you take a look at the visuals, uh, I don't even think the visuals probably warranted the extra uh, the extra rating, but that's just me. NFL 97 for the Saturn, getting a preview here as well as NBA in the Zone 2 and Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition. We also have an ad here for Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey with some referee signals. <laughs> Bowing down for the great one. I think that one's pretty great. No pun intended, of course. And I know that we're running a little short on time as we're closing in on the 50 minute mark. Pepsi World and Kmart and Capcom were running a uh, game pro competition where you could win your own private game room from Capcom. I think that's a refrigerator full of Pepsi. Yes, please. I'll take two of those. Role Players Realm. So we moved from sports to role playing games. Role playing games were starting to become a very big deal, uh, starting with the 16 bit era, but really starting to take off on the 32 bit era. And we have a review of Suikoden here. So, all you Suikoden fans, all, uh, all of you who are watching this particular episode, you get your money's worth if you made it to the 47 minute mark because you get to check out the Suikoden review in Game Pro. And the grades are as follows. Graphics get a three and a half. Remember, I didn't review it. Someone else did. But 5.0 for sound and control and four and a half for fun factor. Interestingly, GamePro lists their top 10 best RPGs ever. Again, remember, this is of January 1997. 10 is Final Fantasy II for the Super Nintendo. Fail. That should be higher. 9, Might and Magic 2 for the Genesis. 8, Super Mario RPG for the Super Nintendo. 7, Chrono Trigger for the Super Nintendo. Wow. Wow. Six, Secret of Mana. Okay. Secret of Mana higher than Chrono Trigger? Whatever. Five, Fantasy Star 4. Four, Breath of Fire 2. Three, Lunar uh, Eternal Blue and Silver Star Story. So they just combine them into one. Two, Final Fantasy 3. And one, Legend of Zelda uh, Link to the Past. Take that list as you will. Then we get to the strategy section where they give us some... Uh, some tips on how to play Star Gladiator for the PlayStation. Again, a game that I should probably look into getting at some point. A lot of characters here. A lot, a lot of characters. There was a fun, uh, there was a fun giveaway that you could enter with Game Pro to honor their 100th issue. 
Three grand prize winners will receive a Nintendo 64 game system, Super Mario 64, Shadows of the Empire, and Pilot Wing 64 games. That's neat. More strategies, this time for Power Move Pro Wrestling, which the magazine did review just a little while ago. An ad here for Super Puzzle Fighter 2. That game is fun to play. I wish I was better at that. We get to their uh, code section here, a bunch of codes to put in. That you can see there for the Genesis Super Nintendo in terms of Game Genie. I think those are all for uh, Alien 3 for some reason. Then more tips and tricks here. I have to admit that I did really want to get to these, especially for games that I owned. I think you see uh, chips there for Madden 97, for Mortal Kombat Trilogy and others. Black Dawn Die Hard Trilogy, uh, getting a Beretta at the start, good cop bonus. Guardian Heroes for the Saturn, getting its own section here. Twist of Metal 2, you can play a Sweet Tooth at the select car screen, plus press up, L1, triangle, and right. An ad here for Space Jam. Uh, there's also going to be a new Space Jam game, I think, that uh, Microsoft is working on. Want these cool Midway games? Get over to Target. So if you go to Target, you can get some sweet Midway video games over at Target. Yes, please. Boy, I miss Midway a lot. Tune in to Game Pro TV. There's a full ad for Game Pro TV there on Sports Channel. And I think we're just about done. And that's it. I think there's a little bit more here in terms of like the Game Pro hotline at the end. And there we go. These are fun to read through, and this would be about as long as I would take. It would be almost an hour to just sit and leaf through all of these pages, read all of the words, check out all of the pictures, read the reviews, check out the codes, see if they work. Um, and you get to these every month. So you figure if you get between an hour or so of reading and there are five or six magazines you get a month, like six hours just of reading rather than looking online. They were great times to live in, I tell you. Uh, I do miss them a lot. But thanks to the show and thanks to the magazines that I've been able to find through eBay, I can relive some of those memories and share them with you. And that's what makes it awesome. Thanks very much for watching, everybody. I really do appreciate it. Until the next time, my friends, take care of yourselves and each other. And we'll do this again really soon. Take care.